As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have an important returning guest tonight, Dr. Jay Nielsen, MD. He's our off-grid doctor who has a survival compound in Haiti, and he's here with us again on Reluctant Preppers to talk to us about the scourge of Lyme's disease and why it's a real and present danger that's affecting many more people than we're being told and at a greater level of impact to people's lives than most people realize but also has some good news for us about a way out. So, uh, Dr. Nielsen, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. It's nice to be with you. I'm always glad to participate. Just so people can understand um, the real cost of limes is how it uh, impacts uh, people's lives. I know that ever since I can recall becoming aware of world news outside my family and neighborhood when I was in junior high and started reading the newspaper headlines and stuff. It just seemed like every year or every couple of years, there's another one of these huge diseases that's going to wipe out life on earth and, and people just keep worrying about disease after disease after disease. And yet life goes on. But something's different about this one. Something, it seems like it's the opposite way around. It's like, this is a big deal that's not well understood and it's really happening so could you talk to us first about for someone who's and some of my viewers on the show know that I'm a Lyme's sufferer as is my wife and that we're currently being treated so I'll have some personal reflections on that but can you talk to us about what you have seen and heard from those who are in the medical community treating Lyme's patients on what the real life cost is to people who are Lyme sufferers well, you mentioned in, in passing there the fact that we've seen a lot of diseases, SARS and et cetera, and really the only one that has ever really scared me is Ebola. We came very close to watching that get loose on the planet and uh, through a lot of expenditure, perhaps managed to control it. But all of those diseases except Ebola have one thing in common, and that is that your immune system will catch up if you can survive long enough. The problem with Ebola is that you die before your immune system even gets in play, which is why it's so scary. You're hemorrhaging to death you know, in days, very few days. Lyme is unique from the point of view that it takes your immune system off the grid. It just says that your immune system is not going to participate. Many of the published authors and writers now are talking about the fact that they don't even perceive this illness as an infection anymore. They perceive it as a failure of the immune system. And the unique reason for that is because Borrelia burgdorferi, the primary bacterium, is the largest single bacteria ever recorded. Most bacteria don't even have known chromosomes. This bacteria has 26. And it devotes them all to defeating the host immune surveillance. Then along comes Mycoplasma incognita, also now called Mycoplasma fermentans. And when this bug got into the tick, it brought its own peculiar ability to avoid detection. This is the reason why Lyme was a very easy disease to treat in Lyme, Connecticut in 1980 and has nothing to do with the disease we're working with today. This disease is, has the, by its very structure, should be looked at not as an infection, but as a barrier. These bugs have learned to make a product called biofilm, and it's a scum that these bacteria will back up against an inert surface like bone or a tooth margin or an ear piercing or uh, a, a, an implant of a valve or an indwelling catheter, and then they will make a layer of collagen and other protein-based material, and then they will hide behind it. 
in doing that, they have deprived themselves of the luxuriant metabolism that other bacteria have because they've walled themselves off and they will slow down. But the antibiotics and the T cells and the white blood cells cannot get to them. And so the entire game becomes about how you get your immune system to see the pathogens and defeat the biofilm. That is a very unique situation that we really have only run into previously in tuberculosis, anaerobic infections that involve dead tissue. Those are the other situations where we go, how do I get my antibiotic to the infection? Now, you're describing um, a hugely important um, a mechanism of the disease. So what is as this is taking place with an individual, how does, it, how does it impact their lives? How does this really hit home in people's lives? What's the cost to them? Well, you know, the cost is because this is the most chronic infection that I will see in my lifetime, everyone's life comes to a stop. They don't feel well enough to go to work, or if they do, they're having brain fog and they're dysfunctional. They're eating up their savings, uh, you know, working on their health care. They're like many medical problems being thrown into bankruptcy uh, because the diagnosis is controversial and also involves frequently misdiagnoses. Uh, The insurance industry is not treating it well. Eventually, this wear and tear results frequently in divorce. I see divorces in my patients all of the time. And in the end, it just simply disrupts all of life's plans. And uh, in terms of the seriousness, that helps us to understand how impactful it can be on a person's life. What about the prevalence of Lyme's? I mean, if we're talking about something that's exceedingly rare, it's, you know, it's a curiosity, it's something esoteric to talk about. But is Lyme's becoming, uh, how, how common is it? How, how well is that understood? And is it on the increase well, or not? It depends on who you want to ask. If you want to ask the Infectious Disease Society of America, which is the um, accepted arbiter of truth for the traditional pharmacons in the insurance industry, uh, this is a rare disease that never occurs. Um, and, uh, of course, eventually requires very little therapy. But uh, the rest of the world, Europe and Canada and all of the countries around the United States are absolutely adamant that this is epidemic in all of their communities. Um, and it's estimated currently that there are 40 million undiagnosed cases in the United States. If I look up and do an analysis of the percentage of patients that I find in my own practice with chronic disease, my own calculations would put me at a third to a half of those numbers, pretty much validating that number and going, wow, these are really big numbers. Something that's that, I mean, that's a huge number because we're talking about a country of a population of 350 million. They're saying up to 20 to 40 million currently undiagnosed cases just in the U.S. or is that a globally? No, that's in the U.S. And you see, the problem is, is that the more that the, I find all of my patients among people who have been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, uh, depression, uh, multiple sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, peripheral neuropathy, interstitial cystitis, uh, failed back syndrome with failed surgery. And what's happening is that this is simply a disease that takes other illnesses and makes the symptoms refractory to care. So if you've got a herniated disc and you have an associated peripheral neuritis, that neuritis seems to like to hit the nerves that have been damaged. So now you go in and have back surgery and your pain doesn't go away because it's already established in that nerve. This is a very complicated process and you really don't get to know. I always tell people when I meet them and I've decided that they probably have Lyme, I tell them, I'm gonna tell you that you have Lyme four times. Once 
when I get a CD57 back. A second time, when working on your biofilm causes a Herxheimer reaction. A third time, when you come back and tell me that you are substantially better. And a fourth time, when I'm all done with my therapy and you've remained better and we have eliminated the symptoms you had when you came to me. I, this isn't like a strep throat where you take a swab and go, there you go. It's much more complicated than that. And it is almost impossible with certainty to say when you have Lyme disease. I had about an 80% success rate uh, in my first five years in practice treating Lyme. And then I noticed there was a pattern to all the people who failed. And only about a year and a half ago did I realize that most of them had black mold. And it does the same thing. It's another circulating neurotoxin with a positive CD57. It just doesn't respond to natokinase. And once that I recognized that pattern, I went off on a different direction. Those people are still equally sick. I just gave those people the wrong diagnosis and the wrong therapy for sometimes up to a year. And now I know that I need to include that in my differential. My great fear is that I have four or five more things like that that I'm not recognizing and want to throw in the basket of Lyme disease. You mentioned, I, I have to chime in here, a little bit of equal time on my personal, you know, you're coming at it from the professional, medical, uh, and also a lot of unconventional uh, new insights that you're bringing in that from people who are really groundbreaking awareness of what's really going on that goes well beyond conventional medicine's view of things. I'll also add in from a person who is a Lyme sufferer that I had the textbook uh, definition of the original onset of it I found and I was playing paintball in the woods 24 hours later found an embedded deer tick right next to my navel 24 hours to 48 hours after that had a circular target shaped rash around the actual bite site and about three days later I felt like I was a 97 year old man and couldn't couldn't get out of bed I was shaking so bad from fevers I couldn't even fill a hot water bottle and chills and 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 everything uh, one week uh, I, I got an actual normal Lyme's test. I can't think what the name of it is that they do, but Western blot, and it came back negative. And but they said, well, let's just treat you anyway. And I felt worlds better within one week of uh, antibiotic treatment. One single antibiotic treatment, and ten days later they said, okay, you're good. That was just urgent care, and I was done. And uh, then uh, over the next six years, I started to feel one, two, three, four major symptoms kind of creeping in that I never connected the dots until my wife finally said, you better tell your doctor this might have to do with limes that you thought was, you didn't even bring it up because it was so long ago. Um, and in, in fact, that was kind of like the, the laser beam that connected all the dots there, um, you know, from brain fog and memory to just, just, just absolutely debilitating fatigue to finally heart palpitations and so on, um, uh, urinary pain and different things like that, that that was not due to an infection, et cetera. Um, and uh, so then we, we went on to the next thing. But what what is it about the original test? that Why, why is the medical system still using a test that is so often uh, false negative? Well, I don't believe there are any tests that work. I believe that because of this biofilm issue, the tests you're doing are tests of the antibodies to bacteria, and you can't get that relationship created unless they're getting to each other. And so my patients almost invariably have a negative Western blot and a negative Lyme PCR. Uh, they may have one band for 41. Uh, the criteria for the ISDA and the CDC is that you have to have five bands. I've only seen three or four patients out of 300 that ever met that criteria, and they were all acute Lyme patients. As I go through treatment and the patient starts to improve, that's when the Lyme test turns positive. Then I'll see two or three more bands show up. And so the whole purpose of this therapy is to get your immune system to engage. And by the time your Lyme test is positive, you're 70% better. Just and so your understand. reason that... You yeah, I want to connect the dots there for people is the what you were describing earlier about this mechanism that the limes have has developed to be able to sequester itself 
away from your immune from detection by your immune system through covering itself with this biofilm means your immune system is largely unaware of its presence but yet damage can be happening so you're feeling worse and worse but the test keeps saying hmm don't see any antibodies your immune system obviously would have detected it and therefore it's not present and you're saying not true so go ahead not true and and again you go back to your case and you know you were treated for Borrelia burgdorferi but that same tick bite was carrying potentially Bartonella and Babesia and Ehrlichia and Mycoplasma and perhaps HPV and EBV and there are a whole series of co-infections and we know depending on the tick the area of the country that the co-infections vary. I've seen patients who came in with a tick bite and I decided in the end that they didn't have Lyme. They only had babesiosis and they actually only got that. Rocky Mountain spotted fever is another one. And so uh, what happened to you is you did a, a decent job of dealing with the Borrelia and, of course, didn't continue treatment long enough to kill it. You only made it, you know, die off and settle back for a while and let your immune system get in the game. But then all those other co-infections kept coming on for years. The conventional treatment and prognosis, what, what will a conventional doctor most likely tell someone who is having these symptoms if they finally, well, if they are able to come up with a Lyme's diagnosis, which sounds highly unlikely, uh, since it's underdiagnosed and under recognized, but if they do, what would the conventional treatment be, and what's a likely prognosis for someone who receives a conventional treatment today? Well, depends on the duration of the illness. If this is acute Lyme, and you're at the point you were at where you've made an acute diagnosis, if you take 30 days of antibiotics in monotherapy, one drug, you have a decent chance of achieving a cure. Your last chance for a cure, by the way, if it goes chronic, you never get rid of it. If you do more than monotherapy in that first 30 days, you uncover the mycoplasma and atypical pathogens, the likelihood that you'll get a cure goes way up. Once that you get out into chronic Lyme infection and you're chronically ill, you're not going to get a cure. You're only going to get a control. The current conventional wisdom of people who are treating chronic Lyme is that we're looking for a way to stop symptoms. We believe that if you stop doing at least some intermittent therapy, you will relapse throughout your lifetime. You know, one of the things that I recommend to everybody who really wants a good experience and understanding all of the issues involved in this is to watch the movie on YouTube, Under Our Skin. The full two-hour thing is all available for free. It's also on Netflix and widescreen, and it is a tremendous movie that deals with the misdiagnoses, the frustration, the symptoms, and the politics. The Untold Scourge of Limes and the Way Out, uh, Dr. Jane Nielsen, I, MD. You made me think of when you were talking about uh, un, people's things that they don't know about it that we totally missed. Not only was my initial uh, treatment too short duration to really knock the thing out because it, it the timing was right, but the, uh, the, the length of the treatment wasn't sufficient. But secondly, something we totally didn't understand until reading up on it later when my wife started having, about five years later, started having some of the brain fog, the ache, uh, unexplainable aches and pains and fatigue and that sort of thing. And she said, this is more than anything else that she's experienced, something that was like my Lyme's disease. We thought, well, that can't be because I got bit by the tick. She didn't get bit by the tick. And some of the reading we were doing saying that the Lyme spirochete is in some ways similar to, uh, I don't know if it's syphilis or whatever, and it's structure. Syphilis. And that therefore it can be, in fact, uh, transmissible between uh, partners. And uh, that was something we were totally uh, oblivious to. Well, it's actually important to realize that we have not done a comprehensive medical study of all of the spirochetes. Uh, the spirochetes include syphilis, and then they include Vincent's angina, which was virtually wiped out on this planet with the discovery of antibiotics. It was a severe sore throat way back when. And then we have this um, Borrelia burgdorferi, and then we have Helicobacter pylori, the disorder that causes bleeding gastric ulcers. All of these bugs all are a 
spike on the end of a flagellate bacteria with that spirals through tissue and penetrates membranes through corkscrewing its way through tissue so it has no barriers. And the most important barrier that it goes through is the placenta. And I have so many people in my practice that come in and we realize that they've been sick for 10 or 15 years and have had three or four children during that time. And I have patients that are 30 and 40 years old, and we're looking up and beginning to ask the question, is the reason that this belligerous, belligerent and obstreperous, chronically ill ADD kid is actually having neural dysfunction and then go back and treat them and, and they start getting better. So we have... Um, both sexually transmitted components to this, and we also have spread through pregnancy. I didn't and those are that. both important to keep in mind. Okay. Well, uh, and again, the biofilm um, uh, video uh, explains it so gra- so visually, it's very much easier to understand when you see that, and it makes perfect sense. You explained to me uh, that uh, we were basically, the test is in there asking, is there anybody left in the, is, is the army left in the barracks? Or are they out, are they out uh, hunting? Yep, no, the army's still all in the barracks. It must not be any strangers in, in the midst. And it says, no, that's, that's testing the wrong thing because it, there's, uh, but then the next step is uh, if you do start to, well, so what is the technique then to disrupt that cloak of invisibility that the uh, limes has hidden itself behind? And does that make you feel better or worse? Well, it makes you feel worse. I I actually, one of the problems that I've seen in my practice is people go off to Lyme specialist and the very first thing that happens is the doctor gives them a sheet of paper and sends to LabCorp or Quest and they come back with $5,000 worth of lab tests, almost all of which are normal and weren't covered by insurance. So now they have one foot in bankruptcy and they learned very little. And uh, the, that I haven't really seen the value in that. The only real test that I do is I would do a foundational test with a CD57. And as you talked about, this is the test that is really measuring how many cells in the line that fights against chronic infection do you still have functioning in the Lyme pathway? And so normal people are 60 to 300. My Lyme patients invariably come in under 40 in some place all the way down to 10. And what that means is that they are throwing everything they have at this infection and have emptied the barracks, have gotten every troop into the field, and it's not working. And you know that you're making progress when you start to see that number improve, and that takes a couple years at a minimum. That's the only test I do. Then the next thing that I do, and I tell people, I just had somebody uh, today in the office who is about half better and now has a family member they're concerned about. And I said, you can go do tests. You can do all kinds of things. But if you just get good quality natokinase and you sit down with this 100 milligrams of natokinase, this is the enzyme that they give during a heart attack and a stroke called TPA that breaks fibrin and stops clots. It is absorbed orally. And if you take it orally, it'll go into your bloodstream and break this biofilm. And you will immediately have what's called a Jerish Herxheimer reaction. For short, that's, that's two German pathologists who describe the fact that you're feverish, ache, and have brain fog from treating syphilis back in the 1900s. And when you do this and you give this natokinase, you're going to feel worse. And I don't want people to hurt themselves with this stuff, so I teach people in the office how to lay this stuff out in a line on a desk like cocaine, divide it up in 16 parts, and take one sixteenth of a capsule twice a day, and then in two days an eighth, and then in two days a quarter. Most patients with Lyme will have a serious Herx reaction when they approach a quarter of, of one dose 
a quarter of what the bottle says you're supposed to take. Now I've exposed the outside world and any therapy that I give <clears throat> to the um, um, bacteria and to all of, all of my therapy is getting to everything that's behind this biofilm. Now I can start antibiotics. Now, I don't use antibiotics initially. Uh, a wonderful author, probably the best published person in Killing Lyme, is a man by the name of Stephen Booner, B-U-E-H-N-E-R-P-H-D. He has an entire series of books. They're so highbrow and intelligent that they sometimes baffle me, but I tell people, read them to get the general feeling. He has laid out a series of five herbs that are all natural antibiotics. And those five herbs, let me make sure that I got them right today, are Japanese knotweed, cat's claw, andrographis, sarsaparilla, and dandelion. And the label on the bottle says take three, three times a day. Well, once I've established this natokinase, and I've gotten some going, quarter of a capsule twice a day or so. I will start a quarter of a capsule twice a day of these five products. Well, that's a pain. you got to buy them all individually. Well, Booner really loves this company called Green Dragon. And after a couple of years, Green Dragon came out with a, a product called LB Core, C-O-R-E. And you can buy it without a prescription. And now you're sitting there working up your dose of natokinase to one twice a day and your LB core up to three capsules three times a day. In that entire process, you haven't needed a doctor. And you're going to get about 50 to 60% better. My problem is, is that I don't think I can get people all well with that program, but it's what I always tell people is a soft startup. One of the confusing things is that natokinase is not our only biofilm splitter. We also see biofilm splitting from xylitol, the artificial sweetener that prevents caries in the teeth and is in lots of sugarless gum. And more important, and now epidemic every place in the United States, is stevia. And stevia is a biofilm splitter, and it's an erratic biofilm splitter. But we have to stop for a moment and talk about stevia because I have figured out this year that it elevates the PSA test and makes you look like you have prostatic cancer. Oh my. It gives you urinary frequency. It gives you irritable bowel syndrome and diarrhea, and it is now the number one cause of vertigo in my practice. One of the things that we're not talking about is we're not talking about symptoms. You know, what does this collection of bugs as co-infections do in the human body? And what is the breadth of this disease? What can it look like? Yeah, you mentioned earlier kind of a things that can be misdiagnosed uh, that may right. in fact uh, be evidence of underlying Lyme. But what are the what are the signs and symptoms that? Uh, that well, that's... interestingly, I just this past month for the third time took a psychiatric patient off of all of their psych drugs because both bipolar and schizophrenia can be the presentation of Lyme. Uh, a PhD and MD in Boston by the name of Dr. Richard Fallon, F-A-L-L-O-N, is the world's authority on this. I took an entire course from him a few years ago, and um, he has done published a lot of research. So first of all, we have all of the depression and psychosis and substantial aggravation of the brain that results in chronic anxiety and that whole psychiatry thing out there. My, uh, my wife is a counselor and she will occasionally make the diagnosis for me. It's important to remember that this is a polyneuritis and a polyarthritis. And what that means is that it is going to hit nerves and that where it hits those nerves may migrate. So you may have a year of pain in your left face and then one day it's in your right arm. You may have arthritis in your left knee. This has happened to me and I come in and say, how's your left knee? And they say, it's my right knee. 
And I go, no, it's your left knee. I hear it is in the records for the last six visits. And they go, oh, it changed sides. Okay. And this may be a warm and red joint that doesn't happen very often. Usually it is absolutely just nothing that you can can do about it, it in terms of, you know, that you can't prove it. You don't see it. It doesn't show up on x-ray. It just hurts with range of motion and is a true arthritis. And then you because this is a neurologic infestation, you have brain fog. So these people have a hard time processing and thinking, which is why I make them bring someone to the office that is healthy to listen to all of the instructions because this is complex stuff. Right. Brain fog is the thing that gets worse when you have a Herxheimer reaction along with generalized arthritic and neuritic pain. Because this affects nervous tissue, it causes arrhythmias. And my stepson is an interventionalist cardiologist, and he sends me a new case a year that he figures out because they have age-inappropriate arrhythmias that are refractory to therapy. A lot of my patients... I have figured out because they have interstitial cystitis. Dr. Jemsek, who trained me, considers urinary frequency along with stiffness of the neck and brain fog to be the classic triad. Most Lyme patients have urinary frequency. Uh, I just saw a patient today who actually had bladder ulcers from Lyme disease. Um, and his entire bladder, when he was endoscoped, was punched out ulcers that finally went away. It's important to remember that the immune system resides in the terminal ileum and that all these Lyme and co-infections also reside there because the largest collection of lymph nodes in the body is around the appendix. And so uh, there's lots of irritable bowel symptoms that, which I'm using a term I detest, but I, people are familiar with it. And when you treat, treatment will result in aggravation of bowel symptoms. And then you're going to use antibiotics, which yeah. is going to cause candidiasis or yeast. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have all of those issues, plus you need to be fixing stuff with these probiotics. And so there, you know, this bug can go any place it wants to go and do anything it wants. Almost everybody who has chronic Lyme disease has elevated thyroid peroxidase and has low-grade chronic thyroiditis. So someone who has chronic fatigue and pain and has been told they have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, I would do a CD57 and, and an adokinase trial on them to separate them from Hashimoto's. Uh, it's a long list. Yeah. And and now with this new, uh, prog this new uh, treatment, prog the, the test that you talk about the CD57 and so on, as well as some of these symptomatic uh, diagnoses that you can make and this, the treatment plan that you've laid out, uh, I want to make sure people understand why would starting to take the natokinase uh, enzyme that exposes limes to your immune system, why wouldn't that make, immediately help you to feel better? Why does it make you feel worse? It makes you feel worse because what causes pain and what causes fever in the human body is a cascade of chemicals passing through the complement system, and those things cause the release of chemicals that trigger pain. People think of pain as bad. They think of inflammation as bad. That's actually the human body's mechanism of healing. That's the reason why people who take Motrin for their arthritis get a knee replacement sooner than people who take Tylenol because they're poisoning their healing. So when you enter into a positive phase of recovery, you're going to see an increase in inflammation. Is it a simplistic way of thinking about it that if the bad guys have been hiding behind this biofilm and they're exposed, that the, that the fallout of the battle, basically the, 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 the products of the die-off and so on, are what, what are irritating to your, to your system? I mean, that you feel... That's exactly correct. You have exactly summarized it. Okay. And then with this new diagnosis and treatment, 
what is the imp- the improved prognosis? The only reason I guess we'd be talking about a different way of treating it is if it's more effective than the conventional way. So what do we see? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm shortcutting this because you didn't get a chance to tell us about after the natokinase in the the, right you get into the last phase Um, I trained I trained with Dr. Joseph Jemsek in Washington DC and prior to Joe's research everybody was putting in pick lines continuous IV antibiotics and giving two three four antibiotics once or twice a day in massive doses we did a two-year study that showed a 12 percent cure rate and control rate. That was a terrible failure, okay? Because what happens is when you continually give antibiotics, the bugs just hide and don't come out. And I actually see this. I'll be giving somebody really small doses intermittently of an antibiotic, and then they'll get pneumonia, and I have to give them full doses of antibiotics, and they won't have a Herx reaction from the big dose. When they're done, I'll put them back on a tenth of a dose alternate days, and all of a sudden they start having a Herx reaction. What Dr. Jemsek proved is that intermittent antibiotics given in rotation changing the antibiotics periodically is kind of like playing whack-a-mole you know you don't know where the bug's going to come up and it doesn't know when you're going to hit it so eventually it comes up and you get to hit it and so i treat patients monday wednesday and friday alternate weeks that means that they're taking antibiotics in the last phase of my therapy six days a month 24 days a month, they're not taking any meds. And so what that's doing is that's getting this bug to not be able to figure out a pattern and develop resistance. And then I'm giving three antibiotics in pediatric doses and then building up to adult doses and then dropping the weakest one and putting in number four, then dropping number two and giving number five as I work my way up a list of eight to ten antibiotics that get tougher and tougher. And when you finally get up into the really big antibiotics, that's when you finally start seeing all of the symptoms go away. And in that kind of a scenario, how long does it take to reach that plateau? Does it vary from from person to person? And what kind of help? <laughs> Very much from person to person. I had a commercial realtor who came in and said, I have a deadline that I have to be well in a year or I lose my life's investment in my business. And she put up with the most hercs I've ever seen anyone go through and completely was asymptomatic in one year. I wouldn't trade what she went through for anything. She took no rest periods. That was a very tough experience. Generally, most of my patients, I say as long as you're making progress, I don't care how long it takes. I'm much more the tortoise than the hare. I usually expect to spend about a month working out natokinase, probably six to eight months doing LB core, and probably a year doing antibiotics. So I'm a little under two years to get most people to a maintenance program. And what kind of a prognosis can most people expect? Uh, Again, everybody comes in at a different stage of acute versus chronic, but how much uh, relief from their symptoms that they came in with can they look forward to? I always ask my patients to, at at the point that they're partway through their therapy and they finish their LB core, I go, okay, if you take how you felt when you came to me, call that 10, and you call perfectly well zero, what are you today? And most people will answer a three to a four or about two-thirds of the way better. In that period in time, they may have gone back to work part-time. They may have resumed going to church when they used to be too tired. They may have taken a chance on going on vacation. You know, they're starting to engage the world again. As I move into that triple antibiotic rotation, they will get more Herx reaction, lose a little ground, but watch their their brain fog get worse, but watch the rest of their symptoms start to go away. And I expect them to come back to me in another at the end of another year and say that I have accomplished a one or a one and a half. That may be as good as I'm going to do. 
And then after that initial, uh, say, up to two years, what about the rest of their life? Is it just as dangerous to walk away from it as I did after my first 10-day round yep. of antibiotics? I tell everybody that everybody I've seen do that, and Dr. Jemsek says the same thing, will eventually relapse and lose the benefit of all the work that they did and potentially develop resistances. Dr. Jemsek would take those people from alternate week antibiotics to every four and then every eight and then every 12, and then he would leave them on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every 12-week cycle. Uh, I may elect also to put them in an LB core program where I treat for a month out of four and do that. Uh, the other thing is I tell people don't ever stop taking natokinase. Don't ever let that barrier come back. Keep your immune system engaged. Well, Dr. Nielsen, this is an eye-opener to a lot of people. I most people may have heard of Lyme sometimes in the past and thrown it in their sort of ash bin of history of their mind thinking that's one of those things that we, everybody was supposed to be worried about and we don't hear that much about anymore. What we're hearing from you is don't believe it. Don't be lulled into um, you know, complacency about this. This is a widespread, misdiagnosed, clear and present danger that's affecting many more people than people realize it may be themselves or, or their one of their loved ones that's actually experiencing some of those symptoms and if they want to get checked everybody who takes this seriously and say well how do i get checked so what do they need do they first of all do they, can they go to any doctor and get a clear answer or are there only certain specialists that they should start with is there something they can no you're you're really better off to find what's called lyme literate mds llmds and um, the um, Institute for Lyme and Associated Diseases, ILADS, and LDOC out of California, and a lot of these organizations maintain treatment lists. You won't find me on any of them. I made a promise to my practice that I wouldn't uh, start taking the public in any significant amount until I figured out all the people in my own practice, and eight years later, I'm still trying to figure out all the people in my practice. Uh, so, but So it won't get you everybody who's out there because you won't find me. But I, I think looking on the ILADS list for doctors would be the place that I would start. And also, one of the things I would want to point out is remember that if you're uncertain whether or not you've been adequately treated, I would challenge you to go out and buy a good manufacturer's natokinase and try taking it carefully the way we described a 16th and 8th, a quarter, a half, and one. If you can't take natokinase, this is nothing but a digestive enzyme. It does nothing to people who don't have Lyme disease. I give it to patients with chronic phlebitis to clear up their phlebitis all the time. It doesn't bother them. Okay? This stuff bothers you. You have biofilm. And then you really can go buy LB Core without a prescription and start your own therapy. You can spend some time working on Lyme disease on your own and get yourself closer to needing antibiotics, even if you're confronted with not having anyone to help you. That was one of my commitments when I started doing this is I didn't want to see people come to me for a $2,000 first visit and then spend $5,000 in lab and $20,000 on antibiotics. My average patient from stem to stern is probably not spending more than two or three grand. And I think we have to get to the point where primary care physicians like me can treat this disease because there aren't enough infectious disease specialists in the country if they did believe in Lyme to fix this problem. Well, Dr. Nielsen, you've always given us an a unconventional perspective on the subjects that we've had you on to talk about, and you've given people some real uh, resources they can go to here. You've mentioned the movie uh, we've got that in, in our list here for people to pick up uh, Under Our Skin right. movie. You've mentioned the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society, ILADS.org. We've got the link to that in our description. So they've really got some things to go on as well as some practical uh, tips to do some, some learning on their own. So just uh, thank you for that, and thank you for always being in our corner here on Reluctant Preppers. You're welcome. I'm glad to be of help. Thank you very much. 